Um, wow, today's sermon, what can I say about it? Um, you know how I've always talked about sometimes you get up in the pulpit and the Lord just changes what he was laying on your heart in the week and he's like, man, you're going to do something totally different. Eh, not this week. Not this week. I have tried to pray and pray and pray out of this sermon. Um, because I know that it's going to, I mean, it, sometimes it's our job to step on some toes. And I know there's going to be some toes stepped on today. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes when our toes get stepped on, that's the lesson that we need to learn the most. Because it, it's not in those times that... Uh, I always have to turn that off. Uh, it's, I always find joy in God's Word. That's the truth. But sometimes God's Word, when it's... When it hurts me the most is when it helps me the most. And um, that's, that's, that's where this sermon comes from. And uh, if uh, everyone will turn to uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And one thing that I learned from a very important woman in my life is Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, go eat pizza. You can find them that way. And uh, in chapter 2, we're going to be starting with verse 1. And what I want to do today is I want to go through this entire piece of Scripture. I want to share it. I want to read it. I want y'all to look at it. I want y'all to be thinking about it as we go through it. I want y'all to think about what these words say and what Paul is trying to convey to the audience. Because it's not important what I think it means. It's not even important what you think it means. What's important is how Paul intended it to mean, because that's the intended meaning that we're supposed to take away from it. So I, I, I want to get down to the root of this piece of scripture. And it's starting in verse 1. It says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy... Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Now, I'm going to stop right there. I told you I was going to read through the whole thing, but I just changed my mind. I'm going to open up with that piece right there. Paul loved the church. Paul loved Jesus Christ. Paul loved what Jesus Christ did. Paul loved the power of Jesus Christ and the power that Jesus Christ afforded the church. And what he's saying right there is, if you have joy, if you have a desire to participate, if you want the church to be what the church needs to be, we need to be of one accord. We can't all be on a different page. We can't all be of a different spirit. We can't all be in different directions and expect the church to be successful. What he's saying to this church of Philippi is, you need to be in accord with Jesus. You need to be in accord with the instructions that you have been given. You need to be in accord with glorifying God first. That needs to be your purpose. Other things are great. But your purpose needs to be to glorify God. And everyone needs to be in like mind, like spirit, like heart, like body, like soul to do these things. So Paul recognized the problem in the church of Philippi. He recognized that there was something askew. He recognized that they were not in accord, not only with him, but with each other. And he goes on to say, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ. Who through, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equally with God a thing to be grasped. But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the same that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be poor, may be proud, that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad to rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul has a definite agenda in this writing. I don't know if y'all can see that Paul is being very specific. As a matter of fact, I have no doubt that when this letter was delivered and this letter was read before the congregation of this church, that the very people that he was talking to and that he was talking about knew that he was talking about them. And that was my concern with today's sermon. Because some of the people that I'm talking to and talking about are going to know that I'm talking to them and talking about them. But it's not because that's my desire. It's not because that's what I wanted to do. It's because it needs to be pointed out. It's because it's been pointed out. It's because it needs to take root. It's because it needs to grow. It's because the Lord has laid it upon us to do the things that He wants us to do and not the things that we desire to do. Now, in this writing, Paul, the first thing that you need to take notice of is that Paul doesn't, doesn't take and say, I'm in prison because I love Jesus Christ. He didn't say, I've been whipped because I love Jesus Christ. He didn't say, I've been stoned because I love Jesus Christ. He didn't say, I've led so many people to salvation because I am the great Paul. Not once did he exalt himself. Not once did he put himself above the congregation. As a matter of fact, he included himself in the group. What he did was he exalted Jesus Christ. What he did was he pointed out the sacrifices that Jesus Christ made on our behalf. What he did was he pointed out that Jesus Christ did what he did not have to do. Amen. As we read through there, we see that he says that the world was not ready to grasp someone in the human form being God. And Jesus Christ knew that. So Jesus Christ took the form of man, something he did not have to do. Paul pointed this out and said, Jesus Christ took the form of man, being fully God. Not something that he had to do. That was a sacrifice that was made on your behalf. Guess what? Before Jesus Christ took human form, his feet never hurt. Before Jesus Christ took human form, his back never ached. Before Jesus Christ took human form, he never cried. Before Jesus Christ took human form, he never suffered in any way. He grew up in paradise. And when I say he grew up, I mean he was there from the beginning. He didn't have to come here and do what he did. He made a tremendous sacrifice on your behalf. He made a tremendous sacrifice on my behalf. And he did it because he loved us. He did it because even though he was above us, he put us ahead to make that sacrifice. He came down being the king of kings, the prince of peace, the most glorious of the glory. And he suffered because of us. Not something that he had to do. The king became a servant on our behalf. On our behalf. And it says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Not only was he obedient to God's word, not only was he obedient to his purpose, not only was he obedient to 
the love he had for us just to a certain extent. He took it all the way to his physical death. He took it all the way to suffering the most humiliating death that a Jew could suffer. To be hung from a cross by the Romans. Humiliating for any Jew of that time period. We have to understand that the Jews and the Romans were in conflict constantly. The Jews didn't like the fact that the Romans had their thumb on top of their faith. Didn't like the fact that they controlled the whole area. The Jews thought that they should be free and they should be ratified to do their own thing. To be hung by a tree, to be hung by the cross, by the Romans. Humiliating. Think about the most humiliating way that you could die. There's a number of things. We could die like Elvis. We could die like a lot of, a lot of weird ways, a lot of humiliating ways. But none of them will ever be as humiliating as the way that Jesus Christ died for us. So Paul takes note of all these sacrifices. And like I said, Paul had sacrificed a lot too. Paul had suffered. Paul's life was full of suffering. From the time that he came to know Jesus Christ, from the time that he was stopped on the road to Damascus, from the time that he was struck blind, and Jesus Christ said, why are you kicking against the goat? Paul suffered greatly. We've talked about it. He did. He beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, bit by a snake, all kinds of stuff. Yet he still carried this love. But he still, still, in this piece of scripture, the focus is the suffering and the, the sacrifice made by Jesus Christ. Not the suffering and the sacrifice made by Paul. Although Paul could have probably done that. And the people knew about him and he could have made a point. But it wasn't about him. So there's lesson number one. There's lesson number one. This isn't about us. This isn't about the things that we've done. This isn't about the sacrifices that we've made. This is not about that. It's about us glorifying our Lord and Savior. Yes, a lot of you have done a lot of great things. But they don't amount to anything compared to what Jesus Christ did. They don't amount to anything that Jesus Christ has in store for you. They don't amount to anything compared to the love and the compassion that Jesus Christ has for you right now. Amen. You, although you're important to me, although you're important to him, although you're important to everyone here, you are not the focal point. Amen. And if you are making yourself the focal point, you're wrong. If you are the focal point of your faith, then you are worshiping in a poor manner. If you are the focal point of everything in the world around you, you're wrong. If you are the example that you want other people to live by, whoo, Lord help those people. Because you are not the example that they need to follow. I'm not the example they need to follow. It's not a me thing. It's not a you thing. It's a he thing. And we need to keep it a he thing. Now, the other thing that we need to see is we need to see Paul's instructions. What is Paul telling the people to do? What is the church lacking? What is not happening in the church? Now, apparently, the church was doing something because he didn't say, get off your hind ends and get out in the streets. So obviously the church was moving in some manner, shape, or form. The church of Philippi was not just sitting in the pews. They were obviously doing something in the community. They were obviously trying to accomplish something. There was an end goal. Amen. So we don't see instructions particularly about getting out and doing things. However, what we do see is we see instructions as to what not to do. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition. Do nothing from conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Now we can get back to the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. Not a single one of us is more significant than Jesus Christ. Yet, through his death, we can see that he counted us significant. So, when we go out and we do things, or when we have things 
that are put before us, when we have a purpose put before us by Jesus Christ, we need to go out and do those things to celebrate Him. Not so that we get a pat on the back. Not so that we get a gold watch. Not so that we get a plaque. Not so that we get a, 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 a shout out from the pulpit. We don't do it for that reason. We do it so that God may be glorified. I was talking about Jeff and Craig earlier, and that's what I, I love about them. It's not a single one of them, not, not either one of those two have ever said, hey, I'm going to do this, but will you please tell everybody about it? Yeah. <laughs> will you point out how great I am? It's very important that I get some glory out of this. Not really. Not really, because if you are the one that's receiving the glory, you are not doing it for the right reason. Not the right reason. You can always tell that person too, because that person never asks, how are you doing? They're always concerned about how they're doing. They're very quick to say, I need this. I need that. This is bothering me. This is bugging me. But they never say, how are you doing? How are you doing in your faith? What can I do to help you? What can I do to, to make things better for you? And does it, you know, it's not necessarily because those people are bad people. It's not necessarily because those people don't care. It's not necessarily because those people don't have a heart. The problem is they don't know how to manage their lives. They don't know how to do the things that's been put before them. I'm going to do an experiment here. Jeff, what can you see in front of you? Nothing. Nothing. Exactly. Nothing. See, it's a lack of faith. It's a lack of faith when we don't care for other people. It's a lack of faith when we concentrate on the problems right in front of us as opposed to praying about them and allowing Jesus Christ to handle those problems, allowing Jesus Christ to remove those things so that we can see the pain and the suffering of others. It's a lack of faith when we don't love our neighbor. It's a lack of faith when we don't help the poor. It's a lack of faith when we don't help the widow because we're so concerned about the things that Jesus Christ can't seem to take care of in our own lives. Amen. Amen. We need to take the blinders off. Amen. We need to see. I've been told by several people not one. I'm not picking on a single one. I've been told by several people that the ministry that we have helping the homeless and helping the drug addicted does nothing for the church. Because the homeless, the drug addicted, and the kids that we serve don't tithe. It does nothing to help the church because it doesn't put money in our bank account. Do you really think that that's the truth? Do y'all believe that those ministries are for not? Do you believe that those ministries are not helping the church? Absolutely they're helping the church. And the financials, guess what? The Lord is always provided. Yes. The Lord is always taken care of. Hallelujah. I will fill this place. Not me, He. I misspoke. I'm not going to do anything. He will fill this place with the homeless if He desires. He will fill this place with the drug addicted if that's who He wants here. He is the one that's in control of this church. Not me and not you. He is the one that dictates who sits in these pews. He is the one that dictates who receives the messages. He is the one that dictates whose heart is pierced. Now He deems that each and every one of you are very important. Otherwise He wouldn't bring you back and put you here. But he's also asking, he's also saying, I have sacrificed for you. I have done this for you. What are you willing to sacrifice to meet your purpose? What are you willing to set aside in your life so that you may serve me better? What are you willing to take out of your life that you deem so important so that you can do the work of God each and every day as opposed to the work of self? What are you willing to sacrifice? We talk about what God sacrificed. We talk about what Jesus Christ sacrificed on your behalf. What are you willing to sacrifice for the gifts that he has given you? Because whatever you set aside, what you're going to learn is you're going to learn that what you do and the gift that God has given you, the ministry that God has put you in charge of, the, the purpose that he's put in your life, will be tenfold better than anything that you set aside. And God is not asking you to set aside your family. God is not asking you to set aside your employment. God is not asking you to set aside your sobriety. And God has never asked you to set aside yourself completely. 
What he's asked is he's asked for you to put him first. What he's asked is that you take all of those things and you put them in a proper order. What he's asked is he asked that you don't put you ahead of him. That's what he's asked. Don't be selfish. Don't do it out of conceit. Don't do it to try and one up someone else. I could care less what they're preaching across the street. He's a wonderful man, but guess what? His message is probably different than mine. And if he's truly listening, he's doing wonderful things. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm so happy for him. But I'm not in competition with him. Not at all. Because God doesn't want me in competition with him. God wants me to worry about this church. I could care less about what other pastors put on Facebook. I could care less about the rotten things that are said about me. If rotten things are said about me, that's wonderful because that means I'm doing something right. So how do we measure up? How are we doing with these instructions? How are we doing in meeting our purpose? How are we doing personally by setting ourselves aside how are we doing this? Are we doing this well in our lives? Are there things that we need to reevaluate? See, that's the whole point of it. This scripture isn't meant just to be heard, to take out, and then to, 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 to shove it on someone else. No, it's meant for self-reflection. It's meant so that you can look at your lives and you can see what you were doing wrong. It's meant to hurt you a little bit. It's meant to make you question your relationship with the Lord just a little bit. It's meant to make you, you, you get that little pang in your heart and that little twist in your stomach and say, man, I'm doing something wrong. Uh, it's meant for that. It's meant for that. But it doesn't mean that it's a hopeless situation. And it doesn't mean that it's a, a process that will ever be finished. Because the more you set aside, guess what? The Lord's going to ask for more. You're going to be asked to step out more and more and more each and every day. But... You know what? The more of yourself that you set aside, the more of him you let shine through. The more of you that you put in the closet, the more of him you bring out into the living room. The more of you that disappears, the more of him that appears, and the more glorious that life is. The more blessings you receive, the more joy you have, and the more that these big notebooks of problems start to disappear. Hallelujah. Because he wants you to be well. He wants you to be taken care of. Because his sacrifice was not in vain. His sacrifice was made so that you could live a more fruitful life. His sacrifice was made so that you could have a fruitful eternity. His, love, his sacrifice was made because he loved you so much, he knew you were dead man walking without it. He knew all these things because he is almighty, all seeing, all knowing, and all everything. He is fantastic. Fantastic. So what it really boils down to is it boils down to self versus service. Self versus service. Am I going to worry more about myself? Or am I going to worry more about my service to the Lord? Which one wins out in that battle? Which one is more important to you? Which one is going to be your, 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 your definition? See, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to do my grandfather's funeral. Y'all like a couple weeks, that's a long time to keep someone alive. No, he was cremated, so we're good. It's okay, it's okay. But in a couple weeks, I'm going to do his funeral. Now, I love my papa. He was a wonderful man. Wonderful, wonderful man. And he did a lot of things. He built a lot of churches. Built businesses. He did a lot of things. The service that he gave to the Lord is evident. Now, did I agree with all his theology? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He's... He's, he's a strict Episcopalian, Lutheran, you know. But guess what? The theology doesn't matter, but the service is there. I can see the fruit that my papa bore while he was on earth. So when people look at you and they're praying over your casket, or they're praying over your ashes, are they going to say, he was so good to himself. <laughs> Sounds weird, don't it? Are they going to say, did a lot for the Lord. Church sure is going to miss him. Community is going to miss him. I remember when he helped me. I remember when he gave me a ride. I remember when he helped me out with some food. I remember when 
even though I didn't tithe, he welcomed me into the church. I remember that, that even though I'd been out on the street for four days, he came up and gave me a hug. I remember that he demonstrated love above all things. So what are they going to say about you? See, that's why I prayed to get out of this sermon, because I don't want to bring that in front of you. I mean, it's my job. That's what I've been called to do. But man, I mean, there's going to be some serious prayer after today, I hope. There's going to be some serious reflection on people's lives. There's going to be some serious questioning about what we are doing. Are you here to glorify the Lord? Or are you here so that people see you and say, that's a good church going person. Good Christian. What are you here for today? What are you here for on Man of Mondays? What are you here for on Wednesdays? Because if you're not here to serve the Lord and you're not here to glorify the Lord, I mean, I'm sorry. You're not helping us. You're not helping him. It sounds harsh. It sounds mean. It sounds unloving. No, I love you. I just don't need you. Y'all dig? Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to, to, to be partakers of your grace. Lord, we allow you, thank you for allowing us to be partakers of your love, Lord. We just pray that each and every one of us can grow each and every day, Lord. We pray that we're allowed to demonstrate the love that you want us to demonstrate, Lord. We pray that you allow us to grow in your holy word, Lord. We just pray that you... You be with us through the hard times, Lord, and allow us to, to remove those problems from in front of our face, Lord. Allow us to see around those and see that there's other people hurting, other people suffering, Lord, and that the answers lie within you, Lord, not in ourselves. And Lord, we just pray that if there's anyone confused about the confidence that we have in you, if there's anyone confused about the joy that we have in you, if there's anyone that's confused as to why we love you and worship you the way that we do, Lord, we just pray that they get the clarity of understanding, Lord. We pray that they get to set themselves aside for a moment and see the joy that you can bring to their lives, Lord. Lord, we come to you not out of selfish ambition, Lord, but we come to you as faithful servants wanting to give ourselves to your kingdom kingdom, Lord, so that we can be enriched by the love and the grace that only you can show us, Lord. And Lord, we just pray if there's anyone that does not know that love, does not know that grace, does not know you, that they say this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins, Lord. Come into my heart and save me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit, Lord, till it overflows, because I know that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to set aside his heavenly throne, to come here and to suffer as man, Lord, to be beaten, to be struck, to be put on that cross, Lord, and his blood atones for the sins that I can never atone for myself, Lord. And when he finally handed it up and said, it is finished, he went to the tomb, and after three days, he rose. Give me eternal life with you, Lord. And after 40 days here on earth, after being seen by many people, Lord, he ascended into heaven with 500 witnesses, Lord, and now sits on your right-hand side as my advocate, Lord. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for giving me freedom, Lord. I thank you for giving me joy. I thank you for giving me peace, Lord. And I give to you my heart, my mind, my body, and my soul, Lord. I am yours. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' precious name, amen. If you said that prayer, if you have any prayers that need to be prayed on your behalf, come to the front, please allow us to pray for you. Allow us to do what the Lord has dictated that we do. And know that we love you. And know that he loves you more.